on our conflict and complex relationship with nature. Aaron has spent the last four years traveling the world documenting the $250 billion a year wildlife tourism industry. His heartbreaking images of boxing orangutans and traveling dolphin circuses have been published around the world. He is the founder of Raise the Red Flag, an ongoing campaign to end these cruel wildlife tourism attractions. Here to show us his work, please welcome Aaron Joukowsky. So much. Thank you, Aidan, and thank you so much to everyone at Exposure. It's an absolutely monumental effort to have pulled off such an event during these times. Uh, but hopefully for the next week, everyone can forget all about the C word because we are here to celebrate the art of photography amongst truly some of the best photographers in the world today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Aaron Joukowsky, though most people call me Bertie. Uh, if anyone was here last year, you might have seen my assistant, Izzy Sasada. She gave a, a talk that introduced my work. However, this year, I'm here to talk about the wildlife tourism industry. So what wildlife tourism is, what some examples are from the wildlife tourism industry, um, particularly using um, examples of jobs that I've been on around the world. And also, I'm here to hopefully offer up some photographic insights. But before we do that, I'll just give a very uh, brief introduction to my work. As mentioned, I'm an envi environmental photojournalist and filmmaker specializing in human-animal conflict. I've been doing this work for about 15 years now. Um, it hasn't always been this way. I actually used to be a copywriter for publishing companies, and then I went on to start a modeling agency with my best friend from school. But then in my late 20s, um, and it was actually during Christmas time, and, and my dad, he's here in the audience, he'll, he'll attest to this. We, we were playing a game, we all went around the table. And it was the alter ego game. So it was who would you have been in a different lifetime? And we all went around the table, and I think my sister was an FBI agent. My dad, he might have been, what were you, dad? Were you mafia? I can't remember. Um, <laughs> and I was David Attenborough, uh, and I had been, like most English people, we'd been brought up with all of David Attenborough's films. I'd always absolutely adored wildlife documentaries, and I had spent, you know, the, the, I was 28 at the time, and spent all that time being brought up on this content and adoring wildlife as a result. And then I went to bed, and I, I didn't sleep for about a week, um, and I thought, why are you spending your entire life fantasizing about living someone else's life? So within a couple of weeks, I'd sold my modeling agency, and I had enrolled in wildlife filmmaking school in Africa. Uh, and my goal originally was to document the beauty of the natural world and share it with as many people as humanly possible. However, on my travels, I realized that things weren't always as they seemed on those BBC documentaries. And everywhere you turned, wildlife was under pressure. They were being exploited, eaten, enjoyed, eradicated to the point of extinction. And we are currently in the midst of a sixth mass extinction event, and that is brought on by the activities of mankind. So from there, I went on to document all, so many different subjects surrounding human-animal conflict, and I'll just talk about a few of these now. So this was actually the first job that I did. It was a story about shark finning in Mozambique, uh, and we were making a documentary for WWF, and we went and lived in these small shark fishing communities in rural Mozambique. Uh, and when we got there, the fishermen this was actually the first shark that they had caught in six months. Normally, they would catch between eight and 10 sharks every single day. But when I got there, they hadn't caught one in months. And the reason behind this is because of the illegal and the industrial fishing that was going on far out of sight and um, on the horizon. So these vessels were emptying of these oceans of fish 
which was their life force. And this is actually a technique that I've come to use a lot in my work. It's called close focus wide angle photography. Uh, it's typically using a wide angle lens. I love the 16 to 35 mil Canon. And you get very close to your subject. And what this does is it gives this kind of visceral looming approach where the subject becomes really the focus of your image. But it also allows you to incorporate all the background elements, in this case, the boat and the fisherman, which is a, it's a very powerful storytelling tool for any photojournalist. So from there, I've been on to cover many different stories. Another one is, is about the traditional medicine trade. And what I saw was it's not just rhinos that are losing their horns. It's not just pangolins that are being targeted for their scales. It's animals all over the world that are being killed, taken from their natural habitat, and used for traditional medicine. And this image was taken in a market in Benin, in West Africa. And it's a, a, a tray of heads um, used in the voodoo trade. Now, voodoo. Uh, it's a way of life in West Africa, and it actually predates religion. It's been around for thousands of years. Um, and animals, parts are used for many different reasons. Uh, you might, for example, take a piece of elephant skin and put it under your bed, and then if you have a court date, it's going to bring you good luck. Or you might have a baboon head, and you put it on your mantelpiece, and then it wards away evil spirits. And this was taken at this market was like something from the apocalypse. You're walking around and there were people screaming and fighting on the floor, rolling around, there's fires everywhere, there's filth and trash, we're getting stared at and harassed. I mean, it's somehow people have this image of this line of work as being quite glamorous, uh, but I can assure you that it is anything but glamorous. This uh, is probably one of my better known images. Um, it covers deforestation in Borneo. And we are currently losing our jungles at a faster rate than at any time in history. And Borneo has actually lost about a third of its jungles in the last 30 years alone. And this image here depicts three different generations of elephants who are walking through a plantation that is about to be replanted. Uh, and this was a winner at Wildlife Photographer of the Year a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's often a question that people ask is, well, how do we take a, an image that might win awards? And for me, it comes down to four things, and that's your subject, behavior, setting, and lighting. And if you have here an, an, an unusual subject, which is the Bornean pygly, pygmy elephant, the smallest subspecies of elephant in the world, displaying an interesting type of behavior, so they're huddled together as if for protection, surrounded by this desecrated, kind of temple of destruction with the appropriate gloomy lighting. And if you can pull off all four of those facets, then potentially you have an image that might go on to win some awards. The exotic pet trade. Uh, this um, is an incredibly, increasingly important subject because every year millions of animals are being taken from their natural environment and are ending up in homes around the world. Uh, and this was a story I did on otters and the exotic pet trade. So otters are being taken from the wild, uh, they're being hunted, the parents are often killed, and then the babies are being sent to cafes around Japan and around Asia. And then at those cafes, people go there and they go and play with otters uh, in the same way that you might go to a cat cafe or a dog cafe. Uh, but I can tell you that otters make the single worst domestic pet on the planet. They stink, they're noisy, they're so expensive uh, to look after, they, they have very fast metabolisms, and they really are terrible domestic pets. Yet somehow, because of this industry, because of social media, and all of these videos of cute otters circulating, uh, it's wiping out otter, po otter populations around Southeast Asia. Uh, and I, I like this image because as a photographer, your goal really is to, you want to create unique imagery, shots that people have never seen before. I've never, I've never really cared about going out into the wild and photographing otters in the wild. I want to take shots that no one has ever seen before. And I doubt that many photographers have, have this sort of strange, slightly spooky, surreal Japanese horror shot in their, in their portfolio. And it just so happened that the, um, the otter owner's daughter, who was a, a three-year-old girl had just got up on the windowsill. This was at their apartment in downtown Tokyo. 
uh, and then the otter just walked across the, the windowsill. I was interviewing the woman at the time, turned around very quickly and took a shot. So sometimes photography is, you can plan as much as you want, but there's also a good element of luck to it. Sorry about that. This is um, not, I know it's not the easiest image to look at, um, but this is a story I did in Cambodia, and this was about um, the trade where about three million dogs are killed every single year for the dog meat trade. Uh, and dogs are rounded up from the streets, they're clubbed over the head, they're stuck in cages, and, they, and then they are dunked into, into drowning pits. Uh, and they kill thousands and thousands of dogs every day in these slaughterhouses, and then they send them to restaurants around Cambodia. And people consume the meat for um, circulation. Believe it or not, doctors are actually prescribing dog meat to people to help with their health. Uh, but I can tell you that dog meat absolutely does nothing for your health. In fact, 50% of the dogs tested in Cambodia have rabies. Uh, so it really is a public health crisis. Um, here, I like this perspective. Sometimes, um, as photographers, we want to be taking different and unique and original angles. You're climbing on top of things, you're below things, you're shooting around things through, through objects. You, again, different, interesting, unique perspectives. Uh, and I, actually, to get this image, again, we, if we talk about the glamour of environmental photography, I had to sift out chunks of uh, dog flesh because I really wanted to get a clean image of the blood. Uh, so I was there scooping out bits of dog flesh and skin and just kind of questioning my life at that moment. But what I ended up with was, I think, quite a kind of haunting image that's called Dog Angel uh, that kind of hints at the brutality of this animal's past. So those are just some of the stories that I've covered from around the world. But here today, we're going to be addressing the issue of wildlife tourism. Uh, as mentioned, it's a multi-billion dollar per year industry. And it was something that I became very interested in living in Southeast Asia, because at every turn, everywhere you go, you will see examples of poor wildlife tourism attractions, whether it's zoos or elephant riding or, or bear farms. There's, there's so many different examples. So I started to research the issue of wildlife tourism. And here are just a few facts. So, so it's an ancient industry. It goes back to the ancient Egyptians, in fact, where Queen... What was her name? I've forgotten her. Ha Queen Hatshepsut in, of Egypt. She started a, to get a private collection of animals. Um, and she would tour all over Africa and then bring them back to Egypt. And that was... Um, then started to charge people to come to her private collection of animals. And that was the world's first zoo. Since then, it has evolved somewhat, and many different industries are part of wildlife tourism, whether it is uh, diving, safaris, zoos, aquariums, so many different industries, and it's now a multi-billion dollar per year industry. Um, but some of these venues have a lot more impact upon the animals than others. And it's also a, it's a very dangerous in, um, industry to look into because uh, People are making huge amounts of money, has links to organized crime and the mafia. So it's something that you really have to be very careful when you're investigating. Uh, also, of course, over recent years, the rise of social media has led to an increase in wildlife tourism attractions, where people are fueled by that need to get that perfect selfie. And that's where we've seen this epidemic of people with taking photos, petting tiger clubs, cubs, or you know, uh, riding on top of elephants. And most of the time, they don't realize the impact that this is having on the animals. Uh, and estimates put it at over a million animals that are suffering at wildlife tourism attractions around the world. So I thought, okay, this is something that I really want to investigate further. So I got a little bit of private funding and I went to Thailand, because Thailand is typically known as the epicenter of the cruel wildlife tourism industry. And one of the venues I ended up at was Phuket Zoo. Phuket Zoo has actually just been closed down recently due to the pandemic and not having enough funds to feed its animals. Uh, and they had the most horrific, um, horrific shows where the elephants would perform. And what, the elephants would be led out to perform during the day, then at night time, they would spend their entire time being chained up. Um, and in order to get an elephant to perform at a wildlife tourism attraction, they go through something called the crush. And I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it's when they put 
young juvenile elephants into wooden crates and they literally beat them until they break their spirits and makes, this makes them submissive to their handlers and easier to train. Again, looking for different perspectives, down on the floor, trying to find a, a unique angle to get a shot of the baby through the mother's legs whilst highlighting the chains. Again, close focus, wide angle. This was uh, at a destination called Phuket Eco Safari Plus, which could win an award for the most inappropriately named venue of all time. There was nothing Eco Safari or Plus about this place. Um, macaques, one of the most popular animals used in wildlife tourism attractions. Uh, they're often stolen from their troop. They're then beaten. They're, they then electrocute them and then force them to perform in shows like this. Uh, and then sometimes you just have to wait for that perfect moment. And this was uh, this metal cage where tourists would come by and they had a load of baby macaques in this, in this metal cage. Like, it looked like a torture implement. Uh, and then I just waited for something to happen. Um, photojournalism is, is often a waiting game. Uh, and then someone, lo and behold, threw a plastic cup at this poor monkey uh, and then sat there drinking. Not the perfect composition, but sometimes um, if you want to get that right image, you just have to, there has to be a bit of luck involved as well. This image was taken at one of the most infamous zoos on the planet called Pata Zoo. And Pata Zoo is run by a politician uh, in Bangkok. And there's been a lot of negative publicity about this place, yet it's still open. And they have a gorilla, they have chimpanzees, they have orangutans, and they are kept in these um, concrete cells for their entire lives. Uh, and what struck me about this particular orangutan was seeing it sprawled out on the floor and just how unnatural that behavior is. Orangutans are arboreal, which means they spend their entire lives in the treetops. The only times that they ever really kind of come down is to mate. So to see it there lying down on this filthy, grubby floor, I thought was a very powerful image. Um, and what you want to do is you really want to connect your animal, your subject, to your audience. Ultimately, you don't want them to just see the, see the animal, you want them to actually be the animal. Again, another way of trying to get some capture empathy is to get that eye contact. And this was an image that was also in Wildlife Photographer of the Year a couple of years ago. Uh, and this was taken at Safari World in Bangkok. Uh, Safari World ha have been running boxing shows for about 25 years now. They actually confiscated the orangutans 15 years ago when tests showed that the orangutans were not being bred there, as they claimed, but actually were coming from Malaysia and in Indonesia, where the orangutans are endemic to. Uh, so all the animals were confiscated, but of course, a few years later, they ended up with more orangutans. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the orangutan tourism industry shortly. Um, so all of this, a director, friend of mine came along on the whole trip and we ended up producing a short video about the wildlife tourism industry and Thailand, which I'd like to show you now. They would beat her and she was overfed and she wasn't given any exercise and she was locked in a box in darkness for 20 hours a day. So that people can come and clap and laugh at them. It's immoral and it's embarrassing to us as a human race. Actually cannot believe what I'm seeing here. These beautiful, intelligent animals who have been dressed up and humiliated and made to perform. Now, which one of these is the greater egg? There's beatings and cruelty beyond belief and abuse that goes on behind the scenes that the tourists don't know about. 
And now at the end of the show, everyone gets to pay about $15, and then they get to ride on the elephant. One of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. That tiger is on a tiny chain, just paces back and forth, and then gets stuck in its chain. This is a wildlife house of horrors. It's disgusting. The tourists come visit us, foresee them, looking them, but no riding on her back, no working anymore. The elephants have a good life here. So, from this trip, uh, we actually ended up releasing this short film and releasing the images to the media. Uh, and it got a huge amount of publicity. It was all over uh, the newspapers. I was on BBC World News talking about wildlife tourism and Thailand in particular. Uh, and from there, it really sparked this obsession, I would call it. Uh, this was about four or five years ago. And since then, I have been to dozens of countries around the world to document the wildlife tourism industry. One of the stories I covered was about traveling dol dolphin circuses in Indonesia and the dolphins are caught from the wild. They're then put in stretchers. Uh, the stretchers are lubricated often with, with butter or Vaseline, and then they are taken to different destinations around the country, put in chlorinated pools, and forced to perform. Uh, this is particularly stressful for dolphins uh, because these tiny pools um, act as a, a kind of echo chamber, and their echolocation just reverberates and ends up, it's, it's incredibly stressful for them, and it, many of the dolphins actually end up going insane in these places. Uh, they also lose their eyesight because they're living nonstop in chlorinated water. Um, so this was, they actually ended up shutting these down a couple of years ago, thankfully. At the Traveling Dolphin Show, they also had uh, performing bears. Now, the way that they will teach these bears to perform is through food deprivation and starvation. And often the only times that these animals will eat is during the performance. So they will throw a hoop, give a treat, throw a hoop, give a treat. Um, and you can see that they're absolutely starving. And then the show ends and they go to the backstage and then they're locked in a cage and, that's, and then they're moved on to the next venue. This was a destination called Taman Safari in Indonesia. Um, it's not just uh, the use of a wide-angle lens. It's very important to have a lot of different tools in your book, uh, a, a lot of uh, different lenses in your bag as a photojournalist. Um, like using a long lens here helped to compact the scene and make it look like the elephants were stuffed into the middle of, of this traffic jam. Of course, it's very... Um, for an elephant to have to go through this type of scene is incredibly stressful for them. They've got some of the finest hearing in the whole of the animal kingdom, so for them to have people riding on their backs and to be driving through traffic, again, is, um, you know, is uh, incredibly traumatic. And actually, at this same place, we documented the handlers who were punching the elephants on the trunks, and we went to get a bit of a closer look. And we could see that the elephant's trunks were full of these puncture marks. And it turned out, we then looked into the handler's hands, and they had nails stuffed in that they were concealing. So that was the way that they would use to, to, uh, to try and train them and tame them. And again, I ended up releasing the images to the media. Uh, there was a big furore, and they came out saying, we treat our elephants fantastically. We've never harmed them, despite of the fact that I had imagery of them actually punching them. And the puncture marks on the elephant's trunks. Here, this is a wildebeest, again, using that perspective to show, um, to show them in the midst of a safari in the most unnatural settings possible. That's juxtaposition between these uh, cars and the metal and the wildebeest and the greenery behind it. This was a story that I did in Jordan about working animals. Uh, and people will go to Petra, 
and then they will pay uh, the animal handlers to walk around. Um, so to save them a little bit of time, uh, they will ride on the back of camels or they will ride on the back of donkeys. Um, except the animals, again, they're treated incredibly badly, they're kept in chains, they're not fed, they're not given enough water, and then between the show, uh, sorry, at the end of the day, they're then locked up and chained up. Again here, using that close focus wide angle to really accentuate the chains on the donkey's face, whilst also bringing in the, uh, the famous landmark of Petra behind. This was a story I did about uh, performing macaques in Morocco. Uh, and this was actually one of the cruelest places I have ever been with some of the worst treatment of the animals. Uh, and what the handlers do is they will grab anyone who is walking past and they will grab you and they will get money off you and they will pull on the chains of their macaques and force them to perform and then extort money from anyone who walks past. Actually. When I was in Morocco, I was told a story, and they said, oh, you wouldn't believe what happened last week. One of the handlers got drunk, and then uh, his macaque escaped and ended up attacking his handler whilst he was in bed drunk um, and ate the guy's face and, and killed him, um, which some might say is karma, but other people will say you are dealing with wild animals here and they can be very unpredictable and this sort of thing can happen and does happen. Something that you see a lot in captive animals is uh, stereotyping. And stereotyping is a form of zoocosis. It's a repetitive behavior that captive animals go through. So if you go to a zoo, or any other wildlife tourism attraction, you will often see animals pacing, head bobbing, weaving, and a lot of the people don't understand that this is a type of stress behavior. You might see elephants that are just swaying back and forth, uh, and that's a form of distress. You get it a lot with the birds as well, where they end up plucking their own feathers out because they're so stressed. This was a recent story that I did in the Philippines, where I'm currently living. Um, Again, having to do it undercover, I can't stress enough just um, how dangerous this industry can be. Uh, this, for example, is a liger sanctuary that is run by the local mafia in the Philippines. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what a liger is, it is actually a crossbreed of a tiger and a lion. Uh, so what they do is they will fly in tigers and lions, they put them in a cage together, they force them to mate, and this is their offspring. And the offspring is, um, essentially, they end up being genetic freaks. Uh, they're Frankenstein animals. They have um, all sorts of defects. This animal here was cross-eyed. We saw other ones that had their heads caved in. And all for what? Why are we doing this? We're doing this so we can go and have a selfie with them. We're doing them so people can prove that they're big and they're macho and they have a, a backyard full of lions and tigers, or in this case, ligers. This was one of the animals. Um, you can't see so much from this image. Again, his head is caved in. Uh, and these are the conditions that they're kept in. It's absolute filth. Actually, a lot of the animals had died at this zoo. And what the owners had done as was they stuffed them. So you walked into the entrance, and you were greeted with a gigantic stuffed crocodile, a stuffed lion, stuffed other animals. That, and the, the sign said, we are the victims of the pandemic. You're not the victims of the pandemic. You are the victims of greed and selfishness. This was a juvenile tiger by the name of Blizzard. Um, and Blizzard spent his whole life on that chain and in that cage, a chain that is maybe one and a half meters long. And then people would go in there and take photographs with him. So for one dollar a time, you can have your photograph taken with Blizzard. Um, and of course, um, another major issue that we have to think about with um, wildlife tourism attractions is the chances of disease transmission from humans to animals and animals to humans. And it was shown recently, for example, that tigers and other big cats catch COVID. Um, so um, uh, also with other animals, um, orangutans catch TB, which was known to come from humans. Um, so really that is um, a major danger to public health as well. This 
was an image that I took in Vietnam of a sun bear with no teeth uh, begging for food. And people would come by the sun bear's enclosures and they would throw Pringles at him, they would throw uh, bags of sweets, and he was there begging for his food. Uh, and I released these images on social media, and I think within a week they'd been shared over a million times. And whilst they caused uproar, I, there's also a, a lot of negative backlash. Uh, I had threats from the owners of the zoo, I had threats from the, the Vietnamese public who said, we treat our animals so well. Um, but really that is kind of part of the job. You have to accept that you will get a lot of criticism. Most of the time, I just want to let the images do the talking. Um, you don't want to come out and say too much. Um, but on the, off the back of this, I then released all of the other images taken from this um, destination, um, which then caused further uproar. A lot, unfortunately, a lot of the time, there is this, um, there's a lot of media coverage, there's people getting very angry, they'll send uh, emails and letters to the zoo, the zoo will come out with a statement, but then ultimately nothing changes. So really that's something that we need to do better at, we need to work together with the authorities in order to make these animals' lives better. At the same venue, they also had performing macaques, uh, this particular animal had, again, almost like a medieval torture implement. I don't know if you can see there, there's spikes attached to his collar. Uh, and any time there was any form of acting out or misbehaving or trying to escape, uh, these spikes would, would dig into the macaque's uh, neck. And then this was at the end of the show. I quite like this image because it shows the firm grip that the handler has on the macaque this look of desperation on the macaque's face, and then this hint here with the cage behind at what the animal's life is like after the shows have finished. This shot was taken um, at the White Tiger's enclosure, which was right in front of a playground. So every day, this tiger has to see these bright lights, these loud noises, these flashing colors, and it was like this animal was living in a nightmare. So that was something that I tried to capture with this image to give it almost this ethereal kind of nightmarish quality by including the reflection on the glass and this kind of vacant stare on the tiger's face. But it was really this individual that ended up changing the course of, well, certainly the last three or four years of my life. So this was at a place called Dam Sen Amusement Park. Um, and this orangutan would be hiding behind these giant boulders. People would come by and they would smack on the glass, they would taunt this orangutan with food, they would scream at it, and it spent its days towering behind these two boulders which were cemented to the floor. And I was with this particular orangutan for hours. In fact, I spent almost the whole day with him. And I would just remember being sat there with my head against the glass and he came out from the boulders and he had his head almost kind of touching mine from behind the glass. I would like to think that he knew I was there to try and help him. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not. Orangutans, of course, are one of the most intelligent animals on earth. These are creatures that share 97% DNA with humans. They're incredibly complex and evolved species that need stimulation. Uh, they, they need constant stimulation. They need trees to climb. So for this animal to just have two boulders living in a four by five meter cell is qu quite simply unconscionable. Um, so really, it was that particular individual that then sparked a four year mission for me to go and investigate the orangutan tourism industry around the world. Because I thought really if we can do this to one of our closest living relatives, what hope is there for any other animal? So I ended up uh, enlisting the help of some good friends and filmmakers, and we decided to create a documentary all about the orangutan tourism industry. So the goal was to see what is the orangutan tourism industry? Where are these animals coming from? Where are they ending up? How are they ending up there? How are they being treated? What is being done about it? So I would like to show you the trailer for this documentary now.
photographers, we all have an opportunity to document and then to broadcast the truth. What we see and what we record can help change the world. My name is Aaron Tchaikovsky. I'm an environmental photojournalist. I've spent the past decade covering human-animal conflict around the world. But now I'm deep into the most important project I'll ever work on. There's beatings and cruelty beyond belief and abuse that goes on behind the scenes that the tourists don't know about. This is a wildlife house of horrors. Everybody buying a ticket is responsible. Travelling the world to enter the dark heart of the orangutan tourism industry. He has an international network. Even some officials have been arrested within this case. I had no idea where this would lead me and how big it would become. The eyes of orangutan is coming before I go to bed and it still remind me that I have to work harder and harder to let them out from the cages. It's great to see that there actually is hope here. This is the story of the wildlife tourism industry and its impact on one of our closest living relatives. So, Eyes of the Orangutan was produced uh, in conjunction with Terramata Studios, uh, who also made uh, The Ivory Game and Sea of Shadows. It premiered on German and Austrian TV recently, and now uh, it's currently with our distributors, and hopefully it's going to have international distribution this year. Um, certainly one of the most difficult missions I have ever worked on. You complete, completely immersed in this incredibly dark subject for three or four years of my life. People often ask, actually, they say, how do you deal with these things? Um, my answer is always the same, whiskey and therapy. Um, oh, most of the time I actually just try, you try and you know, put these feelings to the bottom of your toes and you can let someone dig them out in a few years. But yeah, really this was one of the toughest missions I've ever worked on. And to see the treatment of these animals, to see how they're taken from the jungles and then sent and exploited for the rest of their lives. Uh, and if humans were subjected to this sort of treatment, we'd call it torture. So to summarize, if you can hug it, ride it, or have a selfie with it, chances are it's a cruel attraction. Don't go. These are known to be the cruelest attractions to avoid at all costs, many of which we've touched upon today, but also such... Um, such places like walking with lions. A lot of these places, they will somehow advertise themselves as conservation centers. But I can promise you that 99% of them have nothing to do with conservation. It's about exploitation. Also, uh, for example, touring of civet coffee plantations. I don't know whether many of you have tried civet coffee before, um, but we have this image of people going out into the wild and collecting beans that have gone through the civet's digestive tract. That's not true. The, most of the time, the civets are kept in small cages in farms. They're force-fed coffee beans, and that's then used to create the civet coffee. Visiting bear parks, holding sea turtles, performing dolphins, monkeys, tiger selfies, uh, charming snakes and kissing cobras. Um, this was a big problem in Morocco that we saw, and they'd actually uh, sewed the snake's mouth shut and, and actually removed the fangs of the snakes. And the problem is that most of the time, people, they, they just have no idea. They have no awareness about the abuse that they're saying that is happening, not just in front of their eyes, but also behind closed doors. So what can we do about this? The answer is there is no silver bullet. And it really does take a concerted, behalf, a concerted effort on behalf of everyone to make the lives of animals in captivity better. Because we have to be realistic. The wildlife tourism industry is not going away. 
So, what I've put here is everyone needs to work together to improve the wildlife tourism industry. This includes the general public. You and I, we can educate ourselves to the places that we're going. We can do our research. We can ask around. We can educate our children about certain destinations that we should and shouldn't be visiting. Uh, the authorities, not nearly enough is being done to protect or to rescue animals in captivity. And many countries, they hardly have anim any animal welfare laws at all. Uh, the travel industry, um, by not promoting some of these cruel destinations, it can have a serious impact at hitting these places hard in the wallet. Uh, the media. Uh, definitely there has been more media coverage of animal abuse and particularly the wildlife tourism industry over recent years, but I would argue there is not nearly enough. Uh, and governing bodies. You wouldn't believe it if I told you that many of the destinations that I've covered today are members of such association of the world, as the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So they're actually working with accredited bodies, which is completely mind-boggling. One thing that you can do is you can go to something called Raise the Red Flag with Born Free Foundation. Um, and Raise the Red Flag came about when I was visiting all of these cruel destinations around the world world, and I noticed that there was no way of reporting some of the things that we were witnessing. Uh, so I approached Born Free Foundation, and we came up with a platform together whereby people can take photos, take videos, upload them to the site, and then uh, raise the red flag on some of these wildlife tourism attractions, which then show up on a global map like this. So. If you are interested in visiting any um, zoos or attractions around the world, you can go to Raise the Red Flag, you can check it out, and you can see whether there have been any reports raised. And I would just like to finish with this quote by Gandhi. The greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. What we know about animals and what we know about wildlife has changed. We know more. We understand that animals suffer from pain emotionally and physically, and we must do better. And we all have an opportunity to work together to improve the lives of animals in the wildlife tourism industry. So I'd like to thank everyone very much. Uh, thank you again to everyone who's been involved with Exposure. It really is a privilege to be here and to be amongst some of the greatest photographers on the planet. If anyone would like to know more, it's my website is aaronjakoski.com and Instagram is Aaron underscore Joukowsky. So thank you very much. I hope that wasn't too depressing a start to, to Exposure, but thank you all for coming. Cheers. Thank you, Aaron. You're doing important work. You really are. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break, 15 minutes. Please join us again. And uh, our next presenter is Bildiana Yurikovsky. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>